So welcome everybody. My name is David Porter. I'm one of the business advisors at the Sussex Innovation Centre and my bag is um, investment readiness and helping people get grants. My sectorial expertise is in, in clean tech but that's more of an aside really. Um, today is about um, the world of grants and what you can do to be most successful at getting a grant. What we're not specifically going to talk about today is individual grants and the terms and conditions of them. The reason is quite simple, is because it will be a full-time job just to keep up um, with all the different types of grants. We're, we're going to be able to say some generic things about grants, you know, Innovate UK grants have a certain characteristics and stuff that's um, you will see through Coast to Capital would have different characteristics. Um, but I hope I'm not going to disappoint people by not being able to answer your very specific questions about what costs might be eligible under what particular grant, because we, we're simply not having that level of information. Um, so we live in interesting times. Um, as you will know, uh, there's a number of uh, new grant schemes that have come up. Uh, there's the Future Fund which is being announced and the details of which will come out. This is an interesting one for companies that are looking to innovate because it's specifically to help uh, companies access convertible loans to uh, invest in innovation. The catch is that as a company, you must have already received £250,000 private investment. So it's not for everybody, um, but it's, what it's trying to do is stimulate those innovative high growth companies that have already been invested in. Um, we've got two uh, speakers today that are going to talk about specific grants. We've got Peter Wilkins from the Defence and Security Alliance. Um, and we're going to have David Parry from the South East, South East Health Technologies Alliance as well. We're going to talk about their specific grants. And then we've got a session from Gary Kendall who sits on the other side of the fence. Gary's been very successful um, with CDO2 uh, accessing, raising grants, and, and Gary's got a few tips that he can give us there. So we're going to spend approximately until about 1.35 hearing from these people. You're all going to be muted. Um, if you would like to submit a question for the Q&A session at 1.35, can you please submit it via the chat function? And I, as the chairman, will try and um, get through as many of your questions as possible, perhaps collate questions where appropriate so that we can get everybody's queries answered. Great. So without further ado then, I'm going to unshare my screen um, and I will ask uh, Peter to tell us about grants from, from DASA. Thank you very much. Uh, hopefully everybody can now see uh, my first slide. Uh, if you can't, please uh, say so in the comments. Um, so yeah, my name is Peter Wilkins. I work for the Defence and Security Accelerator um, and I am one of about 12 or 13 innovation partners um, which are geographically spread over the whole of the UK. Uh, and my particular area of focus is the Southeast, which is uh, essentially Kent, uh, Surrey, Sussex and some bits of Hampshire uh, and I'll talk more about my role uh, later on. So obviously what I'm going to say this afternoon is uh, focused on uh, DASA, on DASA's offering um, and on, uh, on the way that we work um, but I hope that some of the um, points I make will be more broadly applicable as well. Uh, right, let me just try and move to the next slide. So I've just got a bit of an introduction to DASA before I go into the detail. So DASA is part of the Ministry of Defence. Uh, we were formed just over three years ago and this is our remit, uh, as you can see on the slide in front of you. Um, so the key words are uh, uh, innovation. So we're, we're all about finding new ideas um, and providing funding and other support to innovators to help them develop those ideas, uh, ultimately to support UK defence and security. Um, so we work across defence and security. Uh, most of our work is in support of the armed forces, but we also work with our police services and also security services, and uh, also across wider government. So we do uh, some work for, for example, the Department for Transport, 
around aviation security and other transport security. And then we have a secondary objective, which is around supporting UK prosperity. And uh, on that front, uh, we were created really with a big, a big mandate to try and engage with small and medium sized enterprises and to try and make sure that the MOD and defence and security and government in general are engaging as effectively as we can uh, with those smaller organisations. So we're here today talking about uh, grants. So, so strictly speaking, DASA doesn't provide grants. What we provide is funding. Uh, we place contracts for deliverables. Um, so it's not state aid. What we are, we're, we're buying um, essentially uh, material. We're buying demonstrations. We're buying uh, work from suppliers and we, we, we pay for that work, obviously. So it's not grant funding, but we, we obviously give money to suppliers in order to help them develop their ideas. And we do that in two ways. So on the left-hand side of your slide, uh, there's a box that says competitions. And this is, uh, this is one way in which we provide funding. So this, for example, is where uh, someone in the army might come to us uh, and they might say to us, look, I've got a problem with resupplying my troops at the front line. Um, the way we do it at the moment is very inefficient. It takes a large amount of manpower and resources. And we think that there's probably innovators out there that can help us do this better. And if we, uh, if we will then go out to the marketplace, we will help that, uh, help that user define their requirement as tightly as we can. And we will then advertise that opportunity to, to our networks and uh, uh, as broadly as we can. Um, and then we'll invite bids and we'll assess the bids and then we'll make decisions about funding in cooperation with the end user. And I'll talk more about how the process works in a moment. Um, I've just put uh, seven examples of some of our previous competitions in that list. Um, it's just really to give you a taster of the breadth of the stuff that we that we fund, which is pretty much across all technologies. Um, so everything from fundamental physics, chemistry, biology, all the way up to uh, a situation perhaps where a supplier has a, a system that they've already built and they just need some help translating it into the defense and security uh, marketplace. And so it's a wide range of stuff that we're interested in. So that's competitions. On the right hand side of the screen, you can see that we have our open core. Uh, and as the name suggests, that's pretty much everything else. So this is where a supplier has come to us and said, I've got a really good idea. I think it could really help in this area. And we can then uh, put them in touch with potential end users to help them uh, explore um, the potential for that idea. Uh, we provide funding to help them develop their idea uh, and then other support to help them carry it forward, so hopefully to a, to a point at which it can be useful. And the open call is truly open. So any innovation that has the potential to improve the way that we do defense or security um, is very much welcome into the open call. So how does it work? Um, well, this is a very simplified uh, way. This is, um, this is just a block diagram of, of the process. So I've put that first box in brackets um, because sometimes we don't say what we want. So under the open call, we, we are conscious that uh, in a lot of situations, we don't know what we want. And there are a lot of situations where suppliers come to us with ideas and actually we never knew that we needed them. So where there's a competition, we say what we want. Under the open call, we don't say what we want. But either way, uh, suppliers will propose ideas into DASA through our web-based portal, which is, uh, which is a very um, easy system to engage with. Where we run a competition, we allow approximately two to three months for suppliers to prepare and to cost and to submit their bids. And then we have a process of assessment. And again, that can run over two or three months where we look at all the bids, we send them out to assessors, we collect their ideas um, and their thoughts, then we moderate them and we select those that we, that we want to fund. And then we'll place the contracts and then projects generally run be from between six to 36 months. Um, and the levels of funding that we provide are, are not set in stone but we tend to provide funding from anything from around 50,000 up to, we have provided up to a million in, in, in some cases. That's quite unusual. It tends to be in the hundreds of thousands rather than the millions. So obviously building on my experience with DASA, these are just a few of the questions that I would recommend that you ask when you're looking at um, applying for any kind of funding. Um, and obviously I can talk about the answers to these questions from DASA's point of view. Um, the first is around match funding. So a lot of um, funding bodies will provide funding on the, on the, on the understanding that uh, the, the innovator will uh, provide other funding from elsewhere. 
uh, in DASA's case, that's that's not true. So we, where we fund a project, we provide 100% of the cost. Uh, the second bullet point is about equity. Um, so again, you will find that some funding bodies and obviously uh, many investors will ask for equity in return for investment. Again, with, with DASA, um, as part of the MOD, as a government um, body, we, we don't take any equity. Um, so all of the equity stays with the innovator. And that's also true of the intellectual property. So uh, whilst the MOD, where we fund a project, will have user rights to the intellectual property, the ownership of that intellectual property stays with the supplier. So there's no change in ownership. Uh, all the MOD can do is to use that uh, intellectual property, not own it, not sell it on, not share it with anyone else without the supplier's knowledge. Fourthly, how quick is the process? So we aim to turn around proposals very quickly. Obviously, we are limited by the same commercial and procurement law as the rest of government. Um, but what we aim to do is, as it said on the earlier slide, we aim to turn around proposals within a matter of months. And when we make a decision, we try and contract within a matter of weeks. Uh, and one of the ways that we do that is to expose all of our terms and conditions up front. So when you submit a proposal to DASA, you are agreeing with the terms and conditions of the contract. And that means that if we decide to go ahead with funding it, in theory, it's a simple case of ticking the boxes and signing on the dotted line. Fifthly, um, there's a question around what happens after the project is finished. So in our mission statement on the second of my slides, you will have perhaps noticed the word exploitable. So we're obviously all around ideas that will have a real world impact. Um, so innovation for innovation's sake is not something that, that we do. We are always very interested in making sure that once we finish the project, there is a next stage that can logically be foreseen to take the work and to carry it on further. And then lastly, the terms and conditions, obviously. And as I say, our terms and conditions are all available on our website. And I would imagine that is probably the case with most, at least most public funding bodies. So a few of the lessons that, um, that I've learned during my time with, with DASA um, and a few of the mistakes that I see many suppliers making. So the first one is that assessors need to un understand really the impact of what you're doing and not so much uh, how clever the technology is. So we get a lot of suppliers that uh, submit bids that are very focused on the, on the technology, very focused on how unique it is, very focused on how clever it is. But what they fail to do is to really, uh, is to really explain what it actually does for the user in the end. Um, and in a lot of cases, um, that means that um, things which are actually good are not funded <laughs> because the users don't understand what the impact is. Uh, the second bullet point is around clarity. Um, so again, what we're not interested in is, is white papers that say, I've come up with a really interesting area of study and I would like some money to study it some more. Um, and I would imagine this is probably the case for most other funders also. Uh, there's a need for clarity about what exactly are you planning to do? What is the next stage of your innovation? How long will it take you to get there? And how much do you anticipate it will cost? And the more uh, concise, the, more, the less vague you can be in your submission, Generally speaking, the more useful the feedback will be that you'll get at the end of the process. Uh, thirdly, don't ignore the risks. Um, those people who will be reviewing your, your, your submission will be looking for risks uh, and they will be ready to ask the questions, you know, what happens if this goes wrong? What happens if that doesn't work? So it's always worth being upfront about the risks and the mitigations, and especially where you're talking about innovation. Um, we're conscious that innovation is a hard thing to do. And a lot of the time you do some you do some work and it ends up uh, not getting anywhere because it was the wrong solution. But uh, innovation is the way that it is is a risky thing to do. And sometimes we come to a dead end and that's fine. Um, so so don't shy away from emphasizing those risks. Uh, fourthly, uh, remember that in most cases um, there will probably be a pre sift process and the people involved in that process will probably not be technical experts in the field that you're, that you're talking about. Um, so the abstract is, is the key part. Um, I always say to suppliers, it's worth spending a lot of time on the abstract because the first person that will pick up your submission and read it will probably not be the person that knows a lot about the technology. What they will need to know is what does this actually do? And that ties into that fifth bullet point, which is around um, the level of detail that, that needs to be submitted. So it's worth asking the question when you're thinking of submitting, how long will people have to read this proposal? 
And if they're only going to have five minutes to read it, then it's not worth submitting a thousand words. And if they're going to have an hour and a half to read it, then if you submit only a hundred words, it's likely to be pre-sifted out. The way that we score in the Defence and Security Accelerator is using those three metrics that you can uh, see there in the sixth bullet point. So there's a one that talks about desirability, which ties into some of the things that I've already been saying. So what does this actually do? Why is it a good idea? Why should we give you money for it? The second one is about feasibility. So is the technology actually feasible? If you conduct the trials or carry out the experiments, is it feasible that you will get to the end point that you're aiming at? And then the third one is about viability, which is more around the potential of the innovator to actually do the work. So that's where you would talk about your business plan, let's talk about the qualifications of your staff, um, all that kind of stuff. <coughs> and then uh, the penultimate bullet point there is make sure that you use opportunities to ask questions. So where we run a competition, one of the things that we do is we uh, give suppliers an opportunity to dial in for one-to-one -one discussions with the technical experts. And even if you have some very vague questions, it's always worth making use of those opportunities because what it would enable you to do is to talk to the technical experts about your innovation and get a very clear steer from them as to whether it's in or out of scope, um, how you might, uh, where it might be tweaked perhaps to, to make it more applicable, which could save you a lot of time. And then the last and the most obvious perhaps is don't miss the deadlines because in most cases there was, there's no flexibility. That's my final slide. Um, I hope that's been useful. I'm happy to ask, answer any of your questions once the other presenters are finished. But those are our contact details. Um, drop us an email if you'd like more information or take a look at our website on the gov.uk website. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Peter. That's really interesting. Let's uh, move over without further ado to David Parry now from CETA. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is David Parry. I look after the Southeast Health Technologies Alliance. So we're moving from defence to health. And um, of course, at the moment, I'd be saying this is by far the most important sector as we're, we're all directly impacted by the problems of uh, a, a virus, which is causing uh, an enormous amount of uh, issues across the system, which everybody knows about. So SETA uh, really drives collaboration between universities, businesses, and care and clinicians. And we're a not-for-profit membership support network. So we have 1,300 members. It's free to join, about 14,000 contacts. And we do know uh, the Sussex Innovation Centre quite well. We have quite a few members who uh, work there. So it's good to be in touch with you. So a beginner's guide. It will perhaps echo some of the sentiments that you've already heard from our defence colleague. Uh, and it is, I think it's actually important to rehearse these things because uh, when you're in the process of writing a grant application, it's quite easy to forget these basic things. So I started for 10, uh, the next steps and where's the money? And this is specifically for the health sector. And uh, I'll just qualify everything by saying, no matter how good you are at this, you will need some luck. Um, I know for a fact I, I'm an assessor for Innovate and for various other bodies. Uh, the latest round for the COVID uh, grant application, the 50 grand, received 8,400 applications for maybe three to 400 successes. So we're, do we're talking three to four percent success rate. Um, you'll need some luck. So first of all, ask yourself some basic questions about funding. What actually do you want to do? This is, you know, sometimes we work with companies writing grant applications. It's part of our job. And this sometimes is very difficult for them to answer. What actually do you want to do? And how flexible are, are you? Because um, a grant funding body will have some money for particular things that it wants to do, but they may not be quite what you want to do. So you've got to try and find a, a meld, a match between the two. How long will it take you to do what you want to do? It's almost like building an extension, double it. It will always take longer. And same with the resource. It'll probably cost you twice as much as you think. So be careful about that. And this is very important, uh, particularly in the health sector. You will need partners. You will need partners. Who do you need to help you? 
most often for most of the grants, it'll be somebody in the NHS or a university medical school. But, you know, you, sometimes you have to have a partner. Most times it's very good to have a partner. So decide who you need as a partner. And decide where you are on the technology readiness level scale. Um, this is something I'm sure that most people are familiar with. Are you at the basic end? You know, is it sort of blue sky thinking? Are you at the other end, which is the nine, which is really down to the uh, business angel private equity? Or are you in the middle, which is where most of the grant funding is, the Innovate UK charities, NIHR, where you're taking proof of concept through to validation, building prototypes. That's where most of the uh, funds I'll describe sit in that middle technology readiness level. Don't pitch to the wrong um, funder with the wrong technology readiness level. It'll, it won't work. So make sure you know where you are on that scale. So how do you increase your chance of success? Again, building on what we've already heard, get information. Nowadays, there's often uh, an event, a blog or something that will help you find out more about uh, the grant. It's in the grant awarder's interest to get them the best quality and best quantity. So they're there to help you. And you know, ring them up, be cheeky. If they've got a phone line, say, will this fly? Could you help? See what happens. Just as we've heard, just make sure you get the timelines right. It's no good if you're a minute late, honestly. And it will always take longer than you think to write it. We, we help companies write bids and it's always, always the last two days. And you go, no, we can't do it in two days. And who's gonna write the bid, who's gonna manage the project once it's there. And a, a very basic element that a lot of people still forget and I see when I'm assessing, it's look, if they've asked you specific questions on the form, answer the question like a, like a GCSE exam, answer the question, answer the question. You know, don't put down what you want to write, answer the question and pick up the language. I mean, it sounds like a trick, but it's not. If they've got certain phrases and sentences and elements, reflect them back just reflect them back tricks of the trade so who funds health research i mean we work with a lot of european countries and actually we are quite well funded in this country genuinely we are sort of the envy of europe believe it or not for the, the funds that are available for funding health research which is great nihr is the big one nihr is essentially the nhs funder of research about a billion a year and that goes, if I'm honest, mostly into the NHS coffers, although there are ways of prizing it out. Uh, UKRI, the next uh, biggest, they are, as you know, the uh, amalgamation of the research councils, which fund basic research, medical research council, BBSRC, EPSRC, ESRC. They were traditionally on their own. Now they're part of UKRI. They fund the sort of university type research and Innovate UK, which funds the more commercially orientated uh, research. 160,000 charities in the UK. I don't bet you didn't know that. A lot of them are involved in health and a lot of them will have bits and pieces of money to help fund research in their particular charity. The big ones are the Wellcome Trust, which I'm sure everybody's heard of, one of the biggest funders in the world of health research along with the Gates Foundation. Those are the two massive ones, but there are others as well. European Union, yeah, we've been very um, fortunate with EU over the past few years. Clearly, that's one that's disappearing, but they are sort of mopping up on certain projects. It might be easier to get some funds now than perhaps in the past, although I'm not entirely sure that UK companies are uh, flavor of the month. And of course, once you move to eight to nine, you need some private funders. Uh, it usually starts with business angels, maybe banks if you can get uh, borrowing. Uh, venture capitalists. I'll talk a bit about crowdsourcing. That's just an interesting one, which seems to have hit the um, press recently. So that's the funders. And I'm just going to talk about four of them in particular, these NIHR, SBRI, Innovate UK and crowdfunding. NIHR, the big NHS pot of money. That's what it does. And it does it by various programs. The ones of relevance to small companies are the HTA, RFPB, i for i and there's also things that they fund that help companies, clinical research net network and clinical design service, where they will help you find NHS partners and they'll help you design trials for free. So they are very useful once you get to that stage. But I'll talk particularly about the I for I, which is the only one which is driven by small companies. The others, you have to be 
in partnership with a clinician. The clinicians have to put the bids in. You can get in there if you're in with a clinician, but you can't put the bid in. It's only eye for eye. So uh, the eye for eye, let's just have a look at that quickly. Uh, various um, schemes on I for I. The the first one, which is of most interest to small companies, which is relatively new, is the I for I Connect. They also have product development awards, and they have current challenges. So they put out challenges. They had one on mental health. They, they'll put them out various times. The one that's of most interest is the I for I, um, and it will fund these types of organisations and opportunities. Devices, R and D. It'll fund. C marking, that's a big thing with medical devices. You have to get regulatory approval. It costs a fortune, quite difficult to get funding to do that. They will help with that. But you've got to have demonstrated proof of concept. This is not blue sky. This is again back in that four to six or seven technology readiness level. And again, as I said earlier, you need two organizations, you need a partnership actually even if you're going as a small company for i for i you need an NHS trust really to get anywhere. But it's great, 100% cost, they'll fund it, it's a contract. And there's not really a limit apart from i for i connect. Once you get into product development, there's not a limit. i for i connect, I think its limit is about 50 to 100, something like that. But beyond that, there's no limit. So good opportunity, but, but, but you do need clinical partnership. Connect. The first stage in this NAIHR funding, specifically at small companies, specifically earlier stage, not quite there yet. Um, it's good, it's a good opportunity and it seems to have hit the spot. A lot of small companies are going for this, 50 to 150,000, six to 12 months, uh, specifically for small companies, be risking. So when you've got i for i connect you can go into product development. So it's a good one, that one, if you want to start, good start. The one where we have worked very closely um, with, with all sorts in, involved in this is the SBRI. They have these across the sector, so there's, I'm sure, one in aerospace and defence and everywhere. Came out of America, SBIR. Essentially, public sector defines a need, private sector develops something to meet the need. That's it, in a nutshell. So in this, you know, clinicians will say, we need some, I don't know, a new inhaler for asthma <laughs> or whatever it is. And the SBRI program put out a call, two phases, first phase, 100,000, six months, second phase, a million, very, very nice money. Uh, it's a contract. They don't take any intellectual property. Uh, uh, we've helped, um, I don't know, eight or nine companies through this and raised a lot of money. They are themed though. They will come out probably two or three times a year with a particular theme. So it might be cardiovascular, it might be, I don't know, whatever it is. Uh, so you can't just put in for anything. If you're in that area, these are the best thing to go for, without a doubt. And they'll, they'll organize seminars to find out about it. Um, talk to us if you want to know any more about it. So Innovate, Innovate's the next uh, big one. Uh, this is uh, the biggest probably. They have all sorts of programs and they do vary. I mean, they're the ones who are behind the, uh, the COVID grant I mentioned at the very beginning. They've also developed an investment accelerator with, with venture capitalists. I think they're working with the government on the new funding schemes, but they have lots of different programs. You can just go and look at this. The one that's open at the moment is a smart grant. We're helping a few companies with that at the moment. Um, <coughs> up to half a million. It's got to be innovative and it really has got to be technology. I mean, those are the key. It's got to be innovative. It's got to be technology. And again, in my book, you've got to have a partner. If it's a clinical application, you've got to have a clinical partner. Finally, crowdfunding. I, I threw this in really as a bit of a curve ball. Uh, it's sort of, I don't know if it's had it there or not, but Crowdfunding, interesting. So essentially, you know, you, you can put um, uh, an, an idea to a crowdfunding organization, like Crowdcube, for example, and if they think it's worthwhile, they will launch something on the back of saying it's got to attract £40,000 worth of investment. Um, and uh, anybody can put some money in for all sorts of different reasons. So some of them will buy you a bit of a share. Some of them you're doing it for the good of everything you know it's all sorts of ways so it's, it's a sort of an interesting developing sector um, 
it is designed for small companies though for uh, certainly for startups and small companies relatively straightforward because you've got somebody who organizes it for you but you will end up with lots of investors <laughs> hundreds of them possibly nowadays i think you need some anchor investors so about if you're trying to raise forty thousand, they they'll probably say we need to find somebody who's going to put half that up as an anchor so that might be a venture capitalist or a business angel network or something um and, and then it will fly but it has raised some significant funds for some companies as you can see there so yeah very interesting opportunity in the private sector for small companies and that's me i think i'm almost to time or maybe a little bit early i went through it quite quickly so yeah if you want to know any more uh do please get in touch thank you hey thank you very much david um we've got a couple of questions come in and i will um wait until the q a session sure. to answer those let's move on to gary kendall now so um david you want to stop sharing your screen i, I don't have anything to share um so i'm going to be looking at this from quite a different perspective it's about my personal experience of going through grant funding um so my background is i'm, I'm gary kendall so I run a small company and we're developing some battery sensor technology for electric vehicles. Um, so what we're doing is, is quite innovative, but we only started doing this relatively recently. So although I set the company up 15 years ago, um, back then I was doing financial software. When I was doing that financial software, it never occurred to me it would be possible to get grant funding or innovative funding to develop anything. So I'm used to having to pay out of revenue 100% of the cost of any technology that I've developed and sold. Now about that, 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 that business moved on, turned into a consultancy business. About three years ago, I made a change of direction. I decided I wanted to do something innovative and new, and I was interested in quantum technology. Um, I started talking with the university then. That's when we started having the, um, using the Sussex Innovation Centre, working with the University of, of Sussex. And it was at that time when looking at new um, technologies that I became aware that there was a whole universe of grant funding out there. Um, so particularly with the Innovate UK funds, it's very common to have um, university partners. So in David's example, he was talking about um, clinician professionals involved. It's quite common in Innovate UK funding to have a university involved. And for me, this was really useful because I was doing, I was looking at early stage work. So I was actually leaning on the university a lot for the technology and to understand what was possible. But also universities traditionally are, that they're, they're, they live off grants. So they're used to applying for grants. So if you're working with a university in a situation where I was and having never applied for grants before, they really gave me um, that insight and that understanding of what um, so one thing I would say that there is a tendency for universities to be so keen on grant funding that they will kind of drag an SME along, even though an SME or a small company tends to lead a lot of grant, has to lead a lot of grants. It's not unusual for a, a university to, to take the lead and push an SME up front. I would kind of, I would say that it's really important not to be, um, I wouldn't say not to be drawn along by that. I think it's very important for the SME or the people leading the project to be actively engaged in it and it to be really to be part of your, your business plan because that's the kind of project that the funder would want to fund rather than something that, that allows a research project to, to carry on because a, a company is involved. But anyway, for me, um, it worked very well getting the university involved. There was definitely a bit of luck there in the early, in the early days. Um, but but now it, it's a, a relatively well-trodden path for us and I can see it being a really good opportunity to leverage what capital we had at the beginning um, to do quite a lot of research. So let's talk about specifically what I've been doing. So although it was three years ago that we first had the ideas, it's probably a couple of years ago we first started looking at grant funding. We've actually had three Innovate UK grants. So the first one has, has been and gone. That was a, a project. So I've seen a project from kind of beginning through to the end. We were leading that project. We have a second one that's live. These are both small projects. And we have a third one that's in a, in a setup phase. So the project, the grant funds that we've been looking at have been industrial strategy funds. So these are targeted funds at particular business problems. So two of those are linked specifically to electric vehicle batteries. 
Um, the, one of them, so these were the Faraday Battery Challenge, which was a, a fund where we first got involved, and more recently was one specifically on, um, on quantum technology. We do have another fund, so it's not just Innovate UK, another grant that came through from the Advanced Propulsion Centre. So what's worth looking for is there are lots of unusual grants that come through Bayes. That's the Biz Department for Business Energy and Industrial Strategy. So, for example, they fund um, electric vehicles through the Advanced Propulsion Centre. There are lots of other things. So, for example, there's energy entrepreneur schemes. There are lots of small schemes out there. So don't always look for the obvious options. Um, so it's, it's worth being aware of what's going on. Um, one way of finding out about these things is using um, knowledge transfer networks. They exist across all sectors. So if you look for a KTN, um, for us, that was one of the first ways we found out what was going on. They would arrange um, collaborative meetings. In the early days, it was great because you could meet up with people and have happen chance meetings over coffee. I think it might be a little bit more difficult to have those meetings until, until the world returns to normal. So let's look at how those grants would work for a company. So typically Innovate UK grants and the other grants that I've been involved in are state aid. You remember Peter was talking about contracting directly to the defence and that not being state aid. But if it's state aid, it means you have to abide by EU rules. Um, I say EU rules, the government has given no indication whatsoever of what rules will exist um, post um, 2020. But up until um, pretty recently, the, the UK has been very generous in the grant opportunities and they almost maximise the, the availability of the state aid. So they will offer almost the maximum that the state aid will permit. Those rules permit certain types of projects. Almost all projects fall under one of two categories because they attract the highest level of state aid. They're feasibility studies where you're trying out something new or industrial research. Now they attract the maximum level of funding, which is if you're a large company, 50%, medium-sized company, 60%, or a small company such as us, 70%. What they will do for a grant is pay 70% of those costs. It's actually, so that means you need to have the money to match fund those. And you also need to be very careful that you have the resources and the cash uh, to be able to handle the cash flow. These grants Traditionally, although this may be changing uh, in for the short term, but traditionally these grants are paid in arrears. Okay, so you need to be able to manage you know, a full quarter of a burn rate of these projects. And there are important tests that they will do when you want the project to make sure that you're capable of delivering. Uh, there, are, there are important kind of finance tests um, that, that Innovate UK go through. So as well as getting your 70% funding of your salary and your material costs, any subcontract costs. The other thing to bear in mind is the company overheads. Now you can actually put together a very complex description of all of the costs of running your business and itemize out your overheads. If you're a smaller company like us, and we tend to be quite, quite lean, um, you can actually just claim a flat rate of 20% of staff costs as overheads. Um, even if that is more than your overheads cost, you can still claim that. Um, the other thing to bear in mind is even though you've got grant income, that doesn't stop you claiming other um, research and development enterprise credits. So all of so your grant costs, um, which would be um, staff materials, you can claim an extra 13% back as research and development enterprise credits on your tax return at the end of the year. The same and being able to fund all this project but it does mean that for many of these projects you can actually get to the stage where um, you're looking at 80 or 90 percent effective funding um, okay so how do you find out about these projects there's basically one big government web portal where i suggest you look and that is um, if you just search google for innovation funding service they basically there is a list of all the competitions and, and the ones that are coming up. You will see that some competitions aren't quite as generous in funding as I was talking about at the 70% of the SME level. So for example, and I think this was because of political decisions to try and get more leverage out of industry. So there are two programs, for example, recently from ATI and NATEP. These are aerospace programs and these will offer only a maximum of 50% funding. When I have seen programs like this come up, it's actually not been relevant for us, even though these pro programs are interesting. 50% funding 
um, is just it's just too rich. We haven't got enough investment for that. So it's, it's worth bearing in mind that those funding rules are not always the, 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 the case. So having said that, um, there was an announcement on the 20th of April about another 1.25 billion from the Chancellor. What 500 million of this was from the Future Fund, um, which David mentioned earlier. But there is some money that's been earmarked of 1,200 grants of 175,000 um, pounds. Now, no, no details yet, but there's two important things to bear in mind there. So those are designed for new entrants. So you don't need to have an existing Innovate UK project. They're also under the state aid threshold, which means that it's quite possible that the money will be given maybe a higher level of funding. It's possible, similarly to the COVID um, grants that David was talking about earlier, that they may be upfront and 100% funded. We don't know that, but 1,200 grants of £175,000 is an awful lot of, of money, although I expect it, like the COVID ones, to be very competitive. Uh, um, okay, so that's, that's the background, um, and it is anecdotal because it's, it's my path through the grant, the grant landscape. Thinking about applying for grants, um, they tend to work in, I mentioned the Innovation Funding Service, which is the um, portal, and they, all the grants that go through Innovate UK and some other grants that use that system answer, ask 10 questions. So it's typically 10 questions of about um, 500 words or a few hundred words. And some of those have appendices. You have to have things like project plans and risk registers. To me, running used to running a small company, I didn't do this stuff. This is this is, in many ways, the way that big companies uh, are used to working, but small companies aren't. I had to learn this. Similarly, universities aren't really na naturally um, working at this, but they have some acknowledgement of it and appreciation for it because they're used to doing funded projects. This is something that you really need to learn and you need to do well because if you show that you know how to if you're able to demonstrate that you will be able to run the project well and you understand the risks that are involved and you understand the way in which you will address the grant need um, then i think the assess that will show through to the assessors and some of the projects that, that come through you, you are lucky but other ones there's an awful lot of hard work that goes in there and there's no there's no other way of getting around it you really need to put these grants together as if you've already got the money and you're working out exactly how you're going to deliver it i mean it's very painful when you put all this work in and you don't get it but the only way you will get it is by is by putting that work in so the other thing to bear in mind is these are very competitive. We talk about open calls. So some of these are called, these are called smart calls now in Innovate UK. These are very competitive because anybody who has got an idea can basically say, this is the idea that I have. So there are lots of companies that, that would have an idea that wouldn't fall into any other funding category will put those forward. So it can be very competitive. The other calls where um, your life has been more successful are targeted calls. So that might be, a particular call about, um, in our case, it might be some electric vehicle battery call, or it might be a call about aerospace, or it might be a call about energy. Now, because they are selective and only certain companies will have technology that meets them, there tends to be a higher success rate. So it's, it, if you have a really good application, you may get as close to a 50-50 chance of, of getting through with that. And so that's kind of one of the tips I was given early on. Is, is, is if you have a technology that really meets a call, then you're much more likely to have success. The other thing that's worth bearing in mind, they tend to have two categories of these, um, of these projects. Small projects, which are typically less than half a million, and that's total costs, not funds, total costs across all partners. Now those, um, once you've put the application in and it's been peer reviewed, you might just find that you're lucky and you've got the money and you start off straight away. This is a single phase process. The larger projects, which are more than 500,000, are a two phase. So basically you will have, um, you'll basically win a place on a short list and then there'll be an opportunity to put forward a presentation, typically a panel review uh, and an interview before the funds are awarded. So, in so now, but what's interesting here is, whether you're applying for 50,000 or 5 million, it's exactly the same application form. So it's 10 questions from Innovate UK 
and um, exactly the same number of words, exactly the same number of attachments. Um, Harry, uh, Gary, I'm, I'm keen that um, some of the uh, attendees get a chance to ask questions and unfortunately sure. we've, we've run over slightly, but to finish up on what you're saying. Put the, put the work in and, um, and hopefully you'll be successful. Great, thank you very much for that. And just to say, those 10 questions that Gary referred to, they're pretty standard really. It's what's the market opportunity? Tell us about the technology. How are you gonna run this project and why the hell should we give you the money? Um, they're pretty standard formats and um, it, it's, it's worth pulling upon someone that's done this before because there is a bit of an art to, to answering these questions. Um, I'd like to um, invite people to uh, ask their questions. I've got one uh, that's come up already. It's mainly aimed at Peter. I'll read it out for everybody's benefit. Referring to DASA funding, will it be applicable for startup organizational change and culture design consultancy who can design new cultures required to support human machine working? Brackets AI driven solutions. Thank you, uh, possibly. <laughs> So, so this is probably an area where um, it would be really helpful to complete what we call an innovation outline. So as a kind of precursor to a full proposal, what you can do through our website is to submit just a few paragraphs on what your innovation is, uh, a rough idea of cost, which you won't be held to, and a rough idea of timeframes, which again, is, 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 we won't hold you to it. What we can do then internally is to, is to share it around other parts of the MOD who work in that area. And hopefully quite quickly come back to you with a either a yeah we recommend you go for a full proposal or a actually no this is not something we'd be interested in um, so hopefully it's a it's a service that we try and provide to, to try and stop suppliers spending weeks and weeks writing a proposal which was never going to be funded thank you very much um there's a second comment that's come in from dan bounce at the university of surrey and um, it's a bit of a plug, but it's also for information as well. There's another type of um, support that you can get access to, which is called a knowledge transfer partnership. And in very brief summary, this is about being able to get access to a um, postgraduate student and associated um, supervisor specialism. You're essentially employing um, someone from the university at a funded uh, reduced uh, cost funded partly by Innovate UK. Um, it can work very, very well. It, it, it can be a means of getting access to some really high level technical expertise at a low cost, but it's also a means of accessing future employees as well. So that's called the knowledge transfer partnerships. A lot of universities have offices which would disperse these, um, but I'm sure if you just do a, a web search KTP, you'll, you'll find the information there. One other type of grant that none of us have mentioned because it's, it's not necessarily in our sweet spot um, are the grants that are occasionally publicized by Coast to Capital. So th this is, it's less innovation money. Uh, we've been talking about um, grants for innovation so far. This money is aimed at allowing people to buy capital equipment. And uh, typically it might be someone that's looking to refurbish uh, a factory uh, or buy a particular type of equipment to allow them to expand their business. There are lots of T's and C's that are attached to these grants such as trading history, minimum size and the sector that you work in, uh, which is why I, I won't go into the details at this stage. But if you go to the Coast to Capital website and you click through um, to look at the FAQs on that, you'll be able to understand whether there's any applicability to you. I was recently asked by um, a company that wanted to develop some software, could I, could I get a grant? Um, often, I'm not saying never, but often software is not funded. Um, it's, it's just one of the rules and I guess historically the reason was that um, software can be a, a low capital expenditure to develop and I guess there are issues around uh, intellectual uh, property protection. That's not to defend that stance, but just to, to make sure if you've got a, a software related innovation, a lot of these funds won't cover that. I've got a, a question here from Gotham. Um, for any grant 
evaluation panel, how important are the following in an application? Turnover figures, VAT number. So, um, and give a quick answer to that and, and maybe one or two of the panels want to embellish what I say, but the, the people that disperse innovation grants, they understand that companies are at an early stage. They understand that some companies may not have even been trading long enough to have submitted accounts or even have any turnover. So if there's a requirement to have a minimum trading history or minimum turnover, it will be stated in the guidelines. Otherwise you can assume that you're eligible. In terms of VAT, you don't need to be VAT registered for this. Uh, it's, it's, it's independent. I don't know if anyone else has got any comments on that. The only thing I'd say about that, um, David, in particular, is the, the big concern is whether you're eligible for state aid, which is if you're a company in distress, that's the only thing you'd have to worry about. If you're a small company for less than three years, um, none of the, incorporated for less than three years, none of those rules apply to you. Um, but it could be an issue if you've got um, a large number of losses from earlier investments, things like that, might, you might fall foul of it. Um, but otherwise, you just need to be viable. Um, it, having a large ha trading history, I think, is important. Let me just say another quick thing about state aid as well, because it's, it's not obvious what this really refers to. Essentially, a company can receive up to 200,000 euros of state aid um, grants and uh, free business support that they might have received from places like the Sussex Innovation Centre, for example, you can rack up 200,000 euros worth of state aid in any three-year period. As you move from that three-year period into the next year, the, the first year, if you like, drops off. So if you had um, 100,000, 100, 100, 100, 50,000, 50,000, as you go into your next financial year, that first 100,000 will disappear from the ledger and you're able to access a grant of potentially up to 100,000 euros. What that means in terms of um, pound, shillings and pence, um, you, you generally just apply a, uh, an exchange rate and, and just add a little bit of uh, leeway to uh, account for any exchange rate fluctuations. So to all intents and purposes these days, it's one to one. 200,000 euros, 200,000 pounds. Wasn't always like that. Um, so, yeah, if, if anyone else has got any other questions. Right, I'm, I'm, I'm glad we've been able to answer all of your queries at this point. I can see some questions more, Gary? On, the, on the comments. There was one about, um, I can see one here about the approach and innovation section on smart grants. Um, so I, I can take that one. Please do. Which is basically, there's, there's a chance on, we mentioned these 10 questions earlier. Now, four of those questions have an opportunity to add an appendix. You should make the most use of that. So um, I mentioned earlier, there's a chance to put a project plan in. Yes, yes, do that, because it shows you're used to running projects. Um, put a risk register in. Yes, show that you're aware of the risks of running the project. The other one is team, so you can put some appendices in. But the really important one is this one that this company is a question here. There's a two-page appendix for approach and innovation. I don't know what the reviewers like to see there, but I would say that the most, it's, but I see this as an opportunity to explain your innovation and the benefits really clearly. It's an opportunity to put pictures in. There's nowhere else in the project. You can't put pictures in the boxes. I don't know if, I mean, David is, is a reviewer here, so maybe he would have some insight from the other side. But for us, that's the, that's the place where you can clearly and concisely explain what the technical innovation is all about and then use the boxes to answer all of the questions. So I'm also a, an, an assessor and what I would say is that often as an assessor you're given a fixed amount of time or fixed amount of budget to review an application and you don't always get through to looking at the appendices. Therefore, don't rely upon the appendices for your application. However, Gary is also absolutely right that if for some reason you're, it's just so hard to explain your innovation in words, um, the, the review will most likely go and have a look at the appendices as well. So they, they are useful, but don't, um, for instance, I've, I've seen applications where the answer is look at appendix four. 
That's the wrong answer on many levels. <laughs> um, David, I don't know if you've got any other comments on that. No, I would agree. I think um, there are limits to how much you can put in the appendices, but I, I think that if people do use the appendices, I would say that's a positive thing generally. And I do try and at least glance at them. And I think you're right, pictures, diagrams, graphs, figures, they're all useful bits of the whole story which can be put in the appendix and should be. Great, we've got another question come through in the chat here. I'm developing an app aimed at school children nationwide. And I've had great traction from schools, councils, and even an Olympic ambassador. Would a university be a best partner to get the app funded and built? Without knowing the specificities, I wouldn't necessarily say that was the case. Um, if you wanted to apply for a grant, uh, all other things being equal, your, your grant application will be strengthened by the fact that you're coming in with a partner, i.e. someone that um, is backing you up as a potential customer. So in your appendices, you can put letters of intent there that they'd be interested to buy this particular innovation. Um, but I wouldn't necessarily say that a university would be the right place to get it built nor would typically the funds that are channeled into university research, would they be the best funds to apply for to build an app? I think one of the other panelists was about to say something unless I mistook the body language. Okay, well, that's great. Well, we're, look, we're coming up to two o'clock. Um, I don't think I've missed any of the comments here. Uh, we've had stuff coming through on chat and the Q&A, so Various channels um, have been used to submit questions. Unless you've seen something else, Gary, come through where you were looking. No. Well, that's, that's great. Well, hopefully people have found this instructive. Just one last thing to say, um, and it's a bit of a plug on, on SYNC's side. We have some grants as well. Um, they're reasonably small. They're up to £5,000. And they're all about trying to help a company sec to secure their intellectual property. And that can mean a number of things. It could help fund the application for a patent. It could help fund um, registering trademark and designs. Um, but we've also been able to give these grants to people that are developing prototypes as well. So in, in the sense that a prototype unit is a piece of intellectual property that you'll test uh, and commercialize, we've got grants to do that as well. So it's up to 5,000 pounds and we fund 50% of the project costs. So it's 50% or 5,000 pounds, whichever is the less. The catch in it is that um, it is paid retrospectively. So you've got to show evidence of having invoiced the supplier, uh, the supplier having invoiced and um, you having made that payment. Um, so there's a bit of a cash flow issue that you've got to make sure you manage there. Great. Well, um, thank you very much. Um, sorry, one last question come in. How careful do we have to be regarding IP during application and creation stage? Rather than me answer this question, let me put it out, say, to, to David. You'll have come across this issue a number of times. I would not put anything in a public document that is going to compromise your IP position. I don't think there's any reason to do that. Um, and I think if you do need to protect your IP position, many of the grant funders will enable you to do that, as you've just described, by providing some sort of resource. You can put IP protection into many of the grant applications, but I wouldn't put it on a form if it's, going to, if it's really critical IP. Great. Thank you very much for that. Any, anyone else got any comments on that, Peter? Um, yeah. How careful do we have to be? I would agree with David. Very careful. <laughs> put down um, IP on these forms it is it is really challenging if you're submitting an application and what and you've got something that is special technically everything that's on those forms is confidential so you're not in breach of any conditions that would allow you to patent the work later which is something that we've done so you do put down your early ideas inevitably um, but then um, then you really do have to um, have to be careful not not to give away too much. So, so, so the only other thing I'd say is um, 
this is where it can be helpful to focus on the impact of your innovation rather than the detail. So if you can write down what it does rather than what it is, then that, that can help you um, keep your IP in the background until a suitable point. That's a really good point, actually. Um, one of the issues which innovators often face is that they're talking about the technology and they need to talk about the benefits. So in the same way, by taking the approach of trying to focus on the impact, as Peter has just said, rather than describing a patent, um, you're much more likely to get um, a successful grant application through. Great. Well, thank you very much, everybody. And thank you for all the participants for having joined us today. We've had almost um, 50 people. So thank you again. And I hope it's been very instructive. And do follow up with the SYNC team if you've got any further queries or want to apply for one of those grants. So I'm going to um, end the seminar now and uh, wish you all a good Wednesday. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Bye.